This is Gareth Aiden, and I am here for the Nashville Bar Association and the Tennessee Bar Foundation to take the oral history of a highly respected magistrate judge and former prosecutor, Joe Brown. Joe, if you will, tell us your full name. Joe Blackburn Brown. And where were you born? Taylorsville, Kentucky. And what was your birthday, please? December 9th, 1940. If you would, let's start by letting you tell us a little bit about your, your mother and your father. Okay. Well, mother was a school teacher at Paducah, Kentucky for a number of years where all her family was. Father was a farmer, uh, moved to Spencer County in about 1900 as a young man and uh, ran a farm there for all of his life. And so both of them married late in life. Father was 54 when he married and mother was 40 and both of them for the first time. He said he'd ask every eligible woman in Spencer County uh, to marry him and finally went to, went, went to Paducah. So, uh, and then I have a younger sister who was uh, born in 42. So this, I take it, uh, this was a family farm that you grew up mm -hmm. on. Yeah, it had been in the family actually since the Civil War. It was uh, a land grant after the Revolutionary War to uh, uh, Jacob Yoder, who was a soldier in the Revolutionary War, and been in the family all that time. It had uh, started out quite a bit larger, and it had, dwelled, it had uh, dwindled down to about my father got there to about uh, 300 acres. Well, I'm familiar with the farm because I know that years ago when uh, you and I were both active in scouts that we took the troop there. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful <laughs> farm and it's a beautiful old home. Yeah, it was it's built in 18, started in 1804 and finished in 1806. Tell me, what type of farming did your dad do? It was general farming. Uh, at one point he had a dairy, but that that was before the days of mechanical uh, milkers and everything, so he gave that up. Basically had uh, tobacco, uh, raised sheep, uh, Hereford cattle, corn. So that was that was the basic, basic part of the farm. In your early childhood, did um, you and your sister go to school there in Taylorsville? Yep. Went to Taylorsville High School, the only uh, school in the county, all consolidated in one, one area. And uh, in fact, uh, part of the property for the school had been deeded uh, by some of the, my Yoder ancestors. Joe, um, Taylorsville itself is, a, I take it, a rather small community? It was 950 when I was growing up, and I think the last census showed it was about 950 still. The county has grown quite a bit because they've got a dam uh, there with a lake, and so you get a lot of traffic from Louisville coming out now. But so the county has grown quite a bit. With um, you know, everybody, all farms have sold off their front forty for for uh, development and such. So the county has grown quite a bit, but the town's still nine fifty. Now, by the time you got into high school, I think that. As I recall, you told me you were asked to go on a trip to Chattanooga? Yeah, our uh, school system wasn't probably the best, and of course my mother was a former school teacher, so she had pretty strong feelings on that. And They were about to cut the school back to eight months, which would have challenged its accreditation, so I ended up going down to Chattanooga to um, check out Macaulay School, and went down there and took some exams, and I don't think I did all that well, so they suggested that apparently I might need to start summer school, which had actually already started a week earlier. And next thing I know, I was in summer school, and looking back on it, it did seem that I had all the clothes I needed for an extended stay. <laughs> so I, I suspect I was had. <laughs> <laughs> what year now was this? Would that, that would have been 55, 1955. Okay, what grade would you be entering? I started as a sophomore. Uh, and I'd, Macaulay had, uh, had an uncle that had actually taught there. Macaulay was founded in 1905, and he taught there for in 1908. And he was a patent lawyer up in Pittsburgh, and he had uh, thought I needed some work. I made the mistake of asking him for a magazine subscription at one point, and I misspelled several words in the uh, 
in my request for a magazine subscription. So he had suggested I needed remedial work as that with the school cutting back ended up, uh, I ended up down in Macaulay. And after summer school, uh, they decided they might take a chance on me at, uh, for a regular student. So I stayed there then the next three years. How did you like Macaulay? You know, after you get over sort of the shock of being in a, in a military school uh, coming from uh, Taylorsville, uh, uh, it was a bit of a cultural shock, shall we say, to start with, but overall it was a uh, first-rate school. You know, faculty was just amazing. Um, a lot of good students. Of course, I was a boarding student, and they had day students as well, but some really great people. Bob Walker was a classmate, and uh, it just some, some great people, great teachers. Besides your, your classwork, what uh, extracurricular activities did you get into in high school? Oh, I got into the rifle team because, of course, I grew up on a farm, learned to shoot. And we had English sparrows that flew through tobacco in the barn, so my father paid me a nickel for every sparrow I could kill, but I had to buy my own ammunition, so I had a, some incentive to be a fairly decent shot with a rifle I had. And So I got on the rifle team, participated in the rifle team was the big thing, and then the drama. I was did a lot of... Uh, more of the technical work in uh, in theater. My acting was perhaps not as good as my carpentry. During the summer times in high school, would you go back to the farm? Yeah, oh yeah, I'm back to farm, Heck, helping cut tobacco, house tobacco in the barn, uh, uh, hay, hay fields and such. So, in fact, that's where I lost part of a finger. I managed to stick it in a pulley that had a big load of hay on one end and a mule on the other end. So I lost a chunk of a finger, but that was probably when I was 10. You learn a lot of lessons like that on the farm, I imagine. You learn a lot of things. I mean, you know, you don't have stores around, so you're basically, you know, self-sufficient. Uh, my father was was a great farmer and could do amazing things with woodwork. He, During the winter, he would make walnut chairs and just made some beautiful chairs. But machinery, uh, he... He preferred, uh, he actually, I was interested in machinery, I always had a fascination with it, so I did a lot of the mechanical work uh, on the, you know, the tractor once we finally got one, and, uh, and uh, so I did a lot of the mechanical repairs on a farm, you've always repairing something, and, but you know, I remember, remember using mules, we had six mules and a, and a horse, and you know, some of the old, I'm, sort of infamous sometimes for using country phrases, but, you know, one like uh, plowing up a snake uh, was true. I mean, in the you'd use a mule and a plow, and once in a while you'd plow up a snake, and of course you're walking right behind the plow. So that would get your attention. <laughs> when did you, uh, when did you graduate from Macaulay? Uh, 58. And what were your, sort of, what plans had you made about college? Well, I had some friends there that were going to Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt had a good reputation. Thought about Center, uh, another fine school. My father had gone there, and several of my uncles on my father's side had gone there, and um, and so thought about Center quite a bit. Ended up in Vanderbilt, um, and uh, started off uh, basically with uh, a physics major and a math minor, and and uh, ended up finally converting over to a math major. And a, Physics minor with a, also a minor in theater uh, and uh, history. How and did you like Vanderbilt? This is a, you know, this that's a sort of progression from small town in Kentucky uh, into Vanderbilt. How did you get along? I did fine at Vanderbilt. I think you know after Macaulay, uh, Macaulay really had incentives to encourage study. If you didn't get your grades and they graded every two weeks. Uh, you had extra study halls, you had Saturday study halls. Uh, so they really encouraged uh, study. And I got to Vanderbilt, frankly, I found Van Vanderbilt a lot easier than Macaulay. Uh, I didn't find Vanderbilt to be that difficult. It was, it was certainly not easy, but it, it wasn't that difficult. How about extracurricular activities during college? Well, I started, started in with the rifle team, which, uh, I did the theater. I was in theater doing set design and lighting um, all the time there. I was uh, vice president of the theater group a couple of years. And 
Was that while Joe Wright was still yes. at Vanderbilt? Yes. Yep. Dr. Wright uh, was the was the director, and uh, um, Robert Baldwin was the uh, technical director. And so I worked with, uh, particularly with uh, Dr. Baldwin, the uh, who did set design and lighting. Right. And uh, yeah, it was an interesting group of interesting group of people. Now, as I recall, you told me that I think as a result of your desire to be on the rifle team. <laughs> And you joined the ROTC. Yeah, that, that got me over into the military. A after three years of military school, I wasn't, shall we say, all that involved with additional military, but it turned out that the ROTC, uh, Army ROTC there at Vanderbilt, was had the rifle team. So if I wanted to shoot on the rifle team, I had to sign up for ROTC. So I signed up actually the uh, second semester of my freshman year, and they gave me credit because of Macaulay for the first semester. And, so I started with ROTC and, and ended up uh, my senior year, I was the cadet colonel, so I was the senior officer, cadet officer for the ROTC my senior year. So it worked out pretty well, actually. Well, that sounds like it. Um, John, what about any professors or events at Vanderbilt that are memorable to you? Um, yeah, you know, over in the, you know, the theater was Baldwin with, uh, uh, Theater work, uh, Alec Marchant with uh, history. Yes. Uh, fine man had had um, had a disease that enlarged all of his features and such, but he was just a delightful individual. Uh, he he did some acting and and actually did some uh, carpentry work with me and some of the faculty productions of theater and he drove a enormous Rolls Royce and it just fit him. Uh, Dr. Boyce uh, over in the math department, again, was just a, a really first-rate uh, individual. A lot of good teachers at Vanderbilt. I, in fact, I took geology my senior year, the freshman geology course. And I suspect if I'd have taken it to my first year, I might have ended up with more into geology. I, I found it just absolutely fascinating. I still drive around, you know, and looking at cuts through the highway and saying, oh, you know, there's, uh, there's such and such a shale or there's the the Cumberland uh, limestone or something, and you know, an interesting, uh, an interesting thing. Everybody ought to know a, a lot more geology. As you, um, as you began to to get into your senior year, um, I guess I need to ask what what plans were you making about the future? Boy, that's so long ago. Um, you know, I had relatives on both sides who were uncles. I had an uncle, um, John Blackburn, at Paducah, and grandfather was a judge there in Paducah and Kentucky. And I had my uncle that was a well-known uh, patent lawyer in uh, Pittsburgh. And so there was some interest in the law. And, you know, at that point, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I, was gonna, I graduated, of course, in ROTC and had a second lieutenant commission. And decided that I might like to go into, into law, and so I went ahead and applied for law school and, and was accepted and actually uh, graduated and then had my deferment for law school. Uh, and the Berlin crisis cranked up at that point in 62. And so I got a set of orders down to Fort Benning to infantry school, and then that settled out, and so they canceled the uh, my orders to Fort Benning, and I'd never told Vanderbilt that I was about to be uh, uh, be changed, and so uh, I still had my law school, so I started law school and had a deferment then uh, from uh, active duty till I graduated in 65. Now, did you begin law school in 62? Yes. Yeah, I went straight from, turned out I was able to go straight from uh, uh, undergraduate to, to law school, so graduated in 62, started law in 62, started law school. Tell me about your experiences in law school, what you like, any professors that stand out? Well, of course, there's always the Dutchman, Professor Hartman, and I still use uh, a number of his phrases and, uh, and such in some of my opinions and such. He was probably the most influential of all the teachers that, that I had there. He, he, was, uh, he could terrorize students. I mean, strong people could quail in front of him. And, you know, he would tell you, you know, don't stand there making noises like an oyster. And, uh, but he was a 
first-rate teacher. I took every course that he offered and ended up with book awards in a couple of his class for the highest grade, particularly contracts, which was the sort of the terror of the first-year class. And Who else would we know in the National Bar that you went to? Well, course? Bob Covington was just starting there, so Bob was a brand-new student there. Uh, um, how about the, classmates? Um, anyone else that? Oh yeah, um, certainly uh, Frank DeWota, uh, Harry Nickel, classmate, uh, Jim O'Hare, who unfortunately is uh, deceased. A um, couple of, uh, well, they wouldn't know him from Nashville, but uh, uh, Bill Wilson, who is now a federal district judge over in Little Rock. He rides mules, among other activities. He, an interesting guy. I'm going. Uh, pheasant hunting with him in North De in South Dakota in December. So first time I've been pheasant hunting with Bill. So I'm, I'm interested to see how that turns out. Uh, so. During law school, did you, um, did you begin centering on any particular part of the law? Well, interestingly enough, um, I was probably a lot of, uh, most interested and had some of the better grades in tax and corporate law. So I was you know, sort of looking toward that area. Of course, I knew I had a, uh, a commitment with the Army, which at that point was going to be, uh, well, if I stayed in my basic branch, which was uh, Signal Corps and Intel Army Intelligence, it been two years, or if I wanted to transfer to the Judge Advocate, um, I had to sign up for three years. So I knew I had that coming up, and so I went ahead and elected to switch to the, to the JAG Corps, and uh, that of course, that got me early grading. Uh, I took the Kentucky bar, which at that point had no bar review course. You just took out Gilbert's or your notes or whatever, and you went up, and it was a three three days worth of essays. And because I was going in the military, they, they had early grading. So I took the bar, as I recall, first, second, and third of July, what, 65. And I think about the 20th of July, I got a letter from saying I'd passed and I could go up to Frankfurt. And so I rushed up to Frankfurt that afternoon, swore that I had not fought a duel or acted as a second in a duel since the adoption of the new constitution. And by golly, I was a lawyer. So you practically walked out of law school and right into your law license. Exactly. They, they had the early grading, so it was, it was within three weeks. Before we leave the law school <laughs> period, um, tell me about your summers. What would you do? Summers. Did that have to do with your military commitment, or, or no? Actually, during the well, uh, yeah, during the summers, actually, I went back uh, first uh, first couple of years. Went back and worked farm, just uh, worked on the farm. Um, got married after the next year, and so that year, then I worked. Uh, I stayed here in Nashville and uh, worked a couple of different jobs doing some uh, legal research for Professor Hartman on state and local tax and sat over in an office uh, for the Metropolitan Housing Authority uh, at a dollar and a half an hour, which was pretty good pay at those days, uh, in an office uh, to explain uh, uh, some urban renewal that they were doing and acquiring property. And it turned out, I think for the whole summer, I had about five people show up at the office to ask questions. So. I took all my, I'd take a state, a couple of state codes down there and I could also do Professor Hartman's work. So I was, I was making three bucks an hour, which was darn good money in those days. You mentioned that you got married uh, during law school. Uh, and of course, I know your wife, Marilyn, she's a beautiful mm -hmm. woman. Where did you meet her? Vanderbilt. Okay. So I was sitting on the uh, veranda there at the <clears throat> Rand Hall and I saw this uh, beautiful young lady walking up, and uh, you know, if you talk about love at first sight, I, I think actually it was. I, I just, it was damn. Now, were you, uh, what year was she in school? She was a freshman. Okay. So, and okay. Uh, I had finished up my freshman year. I was finishing my freshman year at, uh, well, I was finishing my freshman year. And I was a dorm advisor over at uh, Cole Hall with uh, Casey Potter, who ended up, uh, was a law group ahead of me in law school and ended up being dean there at Vanderbilt uh, students for years and years. Uh, but uh, K.C. Potter and uh, so that uh, that led to that led to dating. Marilyn was uh, 
she was 16. She had skipped a couple of grades uh, and been admitted to Vanderbilt early. So she was 16, and I was what? I was younger. I was older, but. Uh, well, so. Needless to say, uh, I'm sure this helped your grades considerably, having Mary <laughs> around to help. Yeah, it was interesting. I, I, uh, it, she certainly didn't hurt him any. I ended up, I think, fourth in the class. And that was back when you actually got number numerical grades, so everybody knew exactly what everybody else's grade was. Now, of course, it's all secret, so nobody really knows for sure who's got what grades. But back in those days, uh, Jim Clark was the editor-in-chief of the Law Review, and I think he had an 87, and uh, Jim O'Hare was managing editor with an 86, and Les Nicholson had uh, 85, and then I followed up as legislation editor at 84. There we go. <laughs> so it, just, but it was a different. It was a different situation then. But there was That's... still a graduate. I think graduating class was 105, and uh, we had uh, we started with four women, and I think we finished with three. So it wasn't exactly like now when it's over half women. It was women were pretty. Scarce in those days at that law school. What about uh, Joe? Let's take just a minute and sure. talk about your family. And first, I, I, I should have asked you to begin with, what was Marilyn's um, maiden name? McGowan. And where was she from? Jackson, Mississippi. Her father had been was a lawyer there, and unfortunately, uh, tragically died when she was about four or five, and her mother never remarried, but. Uh, kept her and her older sister, uh, and they moved around. Her mother was a, taught at All Saints in uh, Vicksburg and uh, was a house mother and for some of the fraternities and so uh, and had a house there in Jackson, Mississippi for a number of years. So, But Marilyn came up to Vanderbilt, and that, that led to that. Were you both Episcopalians um, at that time? That is uh, Marilyn was a cradle Episcopalian. I... I was a little more diverse. Uh, mother was a Baptist, father was a Presbyterian, and because Presbyterians uh, used sprinkling, which the Baptists didn't uh, recognize as a true baptism, uh, he never would switch over to being a Baptist. So essentially, uh, we tended to go to the Baptist church maybe three weeks out of the month, and then there was a Presbyterian church about 15 miles away uh, that, uh, handled Bloomfield and Taylorsville, two fairly small towns. So maybe once or twice a month we'd go, we'd go to the Presbyterian Church. So I, I was somewhat uh, between those two, but Marilyn convinced me that the Episcopal Church was the true way. Well, you know, I know um, your children well, but tell us about the two children <laughs> when they were born and well, what they're doing now. Yeah, Jennifer was born in 94 while I was still in law school. And She's uh, went ahead and graduated, uh, went to Emory, uh, worked for Ross Perot's company for a few years, worked for Circuit City uh, as a computer um, programmer and analysis uh, analyzer. And she has two children, lives in Richmond, Virginia with her husband who's the IT, I guess supervisor of IT installations for uh, Strayer University. And Jennifer's been raising her two children, uh, Joseph and uh, Katie, and she's now kind of going back to um, taking some courses. She, before she married, uh, she spent five years in the Navy um, and retired. Uh, actually, she just retired from the Navy Reserves as a lieutenant, com as a commander, uh, not a commander in 05. And uh, so she's, they're doing quite well in Richmond. We fly over there and see them and periodically, and they've got a little place on at Camp Hatteras that we keep trying to go to. I think out of the last five years, we've been hurricaned out two years, straight two years out of five. So I think we're going to try a different time of year. <laughs> I'm sure it'll work better in the future. Yeah, and then Michael's, uh, Michael graduated uh, from uh, Birmingham Southern and worked with the Boy Scouts as a scout executive for a year or so, and then uh, started working as a guidance counselor and got a master's degree from Vanderbilt and he's now the senior guidance counselor up at uh, Pope John Paul II and has uh, one older son uh, uh, from his wife Karen and then they have three girls of their own 
and uh, Witts that graduated also from Birmingham Southern and has something I think is referred to now as a job. Uh, he uh, graduated and he started working uh, actually two weeks ago with Ernst and Young uh, as an accountant. So That's he's, terrific. He's, so he's out auditing HCA. And we shouldn't forget that Michael was also an Eagle Scout. Michael was an Eagle Scout. I, I never had the chance to be Eagle Scout. There were, there were no Scout troops in Taylorsville or Spencer County. Closest I came to scouting was uh, I did subscribe to Boy's Life, the Scout magazine, but that was about as close as I got it. Actually, now I think they actually do have a troop in, uh, in Spencer County, but sure didn't have one when I was there. But I, scouting was, of course, it's a great activity. I, I worked with with you uh, in Troop 42 here in Nashville for a number of years. And in fact, I still occasionally teach the aviation merit badge and the citizenship. And so scouts are great, great activity. It, it sure produces some fine young men. Let's go back. As I recall, before we talked about your family, you were graduating and very quickly uh, becoming a licensed attorney and were headed for the military. Yep. What happened? Where did you go? I well, started off up at uh, at uh, Virginia University of Virginia, where the Judge Advocate School was. Uh, after we did, we went to Fort Eustis for some basic uh, training and marksmanship training. Uh, I'd shot on the uh, Army rifle team uh, when I was in in, in college, and uh, after I was commissioned, and I remember some major came by and was criticizing my position, and, I, and I'd shot at the national matches the year before on a ROTC team, and uh, or at, uh, and he was correcting my position, and we just finished shooting rapid fire, and they ran the target up, and I'd cleaned it with all a nice little clump right in the middle, and there was sort of this rumph, and he went on to somebody else, but uh, it was, I kind of drew a, a, a quiet chuckle out of it. You, you didn't irritate the cadre too much, but uh, the Jack School was at that point two months uh, long, and I, had, I was fortunate enough to be the honor graduate, and ended up going down to Fort Gordon then for my tour. And Fort Gordon was a very, very busy post at that time. This was December of '65, and they had like 40,000 troops there. They had a basic training brigade, two basic training brigades, an advanced infantry training brigade, the MP School the Southeast Signal School, uh, OCS School, and it was a busy, busy post. So I thought, you know, maybe, and some of my better grades in the JAG School was, again, in the admin, admin law part of it. And I thought I'd end up in maybe doing admin law, but when I got there, it was, it was court martials. I think first year I tried 200 general court martials. So in, in the first year? First year, I mean, we, we started out trying court martials and I stayed there then four years and tried a lot of cases. I did, did legal assistance, of course, everybody did legal assistance. And, but I started pretty quickly doing um, trial work. I started out as most JAG, young JAGs did as doing defense and then would switch over to, to being the trial counsel or prosecutor. But interesting enough, I did try one case. Uh, Lionel Barrett and I was also stationed at uh, Fort Gordon, and uh, Lionel ended up uh, prosecuting a couple of cases, and I defended one. In fact, he got uh, called down for overzealous uh, uh, comments and prosecution of my poor AWOL defendant. Uh, Lionel still has never li quite lived that down, that, that he was a prosecutor who was overly vigorous. Of course, was, no, Lionel switched over after that and doing all defense work. I and, was and, and I, say, yes. Uh, yeah, that, uh, that's one that he, he, he and I still joke about it a little bit, but uh, I switched over then and became uh, senior trial counsel there and, uh, and was, um, then I was chief of, what they call chief of justice there the last year or so. And, got an early promotion to major, and that opened up then a possibility of an assignment to uh, Fort Knox. Um, obviously, this was right during the height of the Vietnam War, and so the uh, question is, you know, where you would be going. The, the Judge Advocate Corps wasn't sending uh, married defendants, uh, married defendants, married uh, Judge Advocates to uh, Vietnam for a while, and then they offered me a chance to be a military judge, um, and so I switched off and was a military judge, then transferred up to Fort Knox, which was 
which was good because my, my father was uh, 84 at the time and was not in particular, was, health was declining a little bit. And in fact, he, he died while I was, uh, while I was there. And so that, and Fort Knox was only 40 miles from Taylorsville. So it gave me a chance. I, I tried some 2,500 special court martials while I was there in 23 months. Wow. So a lot of, oh, we'd try 25 or 30 a day sometime. And it was an AWOL apprehension center. So everybody that was picked up in West Virginia and Western Virginia, Southern Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, part of Tennessee, all were brought into Fort Knox for processing. And that, that second period while you were at Fort Knox, how many years did that last? It was two years. So I, I ended up about uh, six years on active duty, six, 65 through uh, June, of seven, June of 71. You obviously became very knowledgeable in the code of military justice. Got real familiar with UCMJ. And looking back, what any comments on the code? Oh, you know, I think... A lot of people, particularly in those those days, and even still today, sometimes think the you know the military justice system is sort of one-sided, and actually, it's probably the f among the fairest systems you'll ever see. I mean, you know, we talk about Miranda uh, and uh, and uh, uh, Gillian for a, a appointment of counsel. Military for general court martials uh, required appointment of counsel. Long before that, Article 31 of the UCMJ required uh, advice of rights uh, to anybody that was being questioned. So, I mean, all those came in long before the Supreme Court imposed them on anybody else. So, counsel and advice of rights were military innovations long before the Supreme Court put put it in. And the counsel that I dealt with, the defense counsel, were they were good attorneys and they were they were vigorous. Um, so, and, you know, they, there was a question, well, you know, the courts are officers, generally speaking, and they're picked and, and such. But uh, courts I, I dealt with were, you know, they were conscientious people that, that tried to do their best. And I, in all the years I was in the military, I never saw a case of what I thought was command influence of a commander trying to dictate a result. I mean, it was, it was a good, good system. Um, some, and some of the officers I served with were some of the finest people I've I've ever known. This, they were really getting the cream, the jag because of the Vietnam War and everything. They were really getting the cream of law schools that, you know, you could sign up to the JAG Corps and you avoided being drafted or exactly. something else. So, exactly. they were getting some first-rate people. I mean, it was it was competitive. As you um, as you neared the end of your of your term as as judge in the military. What plans did you make about the future? And I think this would be about 1971. 71. Yeah, you know, I, I was finishing up at, 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 at Fort Knox, the tour there, and was looking for where my next assignment was going to be. And I was a major at the point. And at that point, they, the Army really didn't use majors to try cases anymore. They, the, the people trying the cases were, were basically the captains uh, and later lieutenants. And so, I wasn't looking, going to be doing much trial work, and you know, frankly, 2,500 AWOL cases, uh, 2,500 cases out of which I think probably about 2,300 of them were AWOL, wasn't the most exciting uh, court martials in the world. So, and I really wasn't going to try general court martials till probably another five or six years in my career. So, I thought about it a long time. I came very, very close to making a career out of the Army, but decided I'd like to try something else and. So I started applying with uh, U.S. Attorney's offices and applied to the two in Kentucky and one here in Nashville. And uh, Kentucky, the one in Louisville, uh, he had to have permission of the senator, Republican at that point senator, and he was in a contest with the Justice Department over appointing a district judge that the department didn't want and he wanted. So he never would uh, give an okay to fill the position in Louisville. And the guy in Lexington, uh, wrote a letter back and said he only hired people that lived in the in the eastern district of Kentucky, but he was short, and if I knew anybody, uh, let him know, which sort of irritated me. Uh, you know, uh, my sister lived in Lexington. Uh, Spencer County was just two counties removed, but 
So I wrote uh, Charlie Anderson, who was the U.S. Attorney here in Nashville, and he invited me down for a, for an interview and uh, offered me a job. So he had just gotten a new position, um, so I was going to be the sixth U.S. Attorney, sixth Assistant U.S. Attorney. It was a new position, so, so I. Yeah, yeah. Was the size of the office compared to what we have now? <laughs> Very small. Right. I, I was uh, had the U.S. attorney and five assistants, and then I made the sixth. So it was a total of seven, counting the U.S. attorney. And now it's the U.S. attorney and I think 41 or 42 assistants. So it's been a r big, big increase. Of course, you know, district judges, we had two district judges at that point. Uh, Judge Miller and, uh, I'm not sorry, not Judge Miller. Judge Miller was on the Court of Appeals. Judge Morton and Judge Gray, and one magistrate judge, uh, and that was, so that was three, three judges counting magistrate judges, and the, um, of course now we've got, what, four active judges, two senior judges, we've got three magistrate judges, and I'm retired and recalled, so sort of a recall or a senior magistrate judge, so big increase in size over, over the years, but you know, when I came there, there was Ames Davis and Fred Thompson, uh, Ira Parker, um, George Lefevre, and Buford Bates. Well, that was the that was the assistants. And yeah, interesting enough, uh, Charlie Anderson kind of irritated, uh, didn't get along very well with either Judge Gray or Judge Morton. So I ended up being kind of the go-between because once we got a seventh assistant, then we could have a someone designated as first assistant. And Charlie designated me first assistant, and I stayed first assistant then under Charlie and under uh, Hal Harden until I was appointed, uh, court appointed U.S. Attorney in uh, July of uh, 81 and then U.S. Attorney in, uh, uh, later in 81. So you worked as an assistant for 10 years right. before you got the appointment to be the U.S. Yep. District Attorney. Yep. And tried, a, tried a lot of, we tried a lot of cases. Uh, Tell us about some of them. Oh, I th you know, I think First, what I came into, I came in and came in, and uh, one of the first cases I got was the prosecution of uh, Charlie Galbraith, who was a rather oh, infamous or famous, depending on, your, on, on who was telling the story, uh, judge, uh, and then in private practice, but he was charged with tax evasion. And I ended up getting uh, assigned the case along with Charlie Anderson, who was uh, going to try it. And, uh, all the the local judges all recused themselves uh, from his case, and we got a judge in from Michigan, and it turned out to be a real struggle. And and uh, Cecil Branstetter was defending him along with Alan High and uh, Carol Kilgore. So those were the three attorneys on the defense, and they brought Anderson in. Uh, they brought uh, Galbraith in one time for a meeting with uh, the the prosecution team and we did it in Charlie Anderson's office and brought Galbraith in and as I recall Cecil said something about well you're going to put the cuffs on him and and Charlie said oh uh, said no he's not uh, we're not going to we're not going to put cuffs he's not a criminal not a real criminal and damn we came to trial and I'll be darned the that got the, mentioned I bet they made a they made a motion to to put that in as an admission against interest, and Judge Fox, bless his soul, let it in. And after that, after that came in, Charlie Anderson left left counsel table, so I finished the trial up by myself. <laughs> and uh, he oh, also good deed. Ever oh, that's right. right. And I know there was another instruction that uh, Cecil got, and the Supreme Court had specifically said it wasn't an appropriate instruction. And of course, I objected with all my due, you know, anger, not anger, but due indignant, being indignant. And the judge says, well, I'm going to give it anyway. You can appeal. Uh, to which I said, well, judge, if I win, I don't need to appeal. And if I lose, I can't. And he said, that's my ruling. Mr. Brown, proceed. So, you know, I still remember Judge Fox, and uh, the jury proceeded to acquit him. So uh, that that was that was uh, you know that was a, that was one. Uh, Cecil did a, an excellent job with that case. Uh, he, he always and, does. Oh, he does. And uh, so that was you know that was an early start. We had one massive fraud case that 
in those days was probably the biggest case we'd ever tried here. It had, you know, I think it started off with about 30 defendants. Jim Neal and uh, Aubrey Harwell were defending the main guy with the money, and then this was a sales group that sold this tire sealant that would do miracles for your tires. You'd never have another flat. And they sold distributorships throughout all states except Hawaii and Alaska. And of course the stuff was just bogus. It wouldn't wouldn't it was designed to work in tractor tires. It wouldn't seal a a, a car and if you put enough in to seal it, the thing would be like driving on a donut. But they sold, I don't know, thirteen hundred distributorships throughout the country. And we Ray Whitley and I prosecuted it along with Charlie Fells. And it was a six week trial and I think the jury was thirty five accounts or so and I think we had I've forgotten how many witnesses? We had maybe 130 witnesses, 35 counts. Jury was out about two hours and convicted everybody of everything. But uh, Fred Thompson was one of the attorneys in the case. Uh, Jim Price, Jim Neal, now, Charlie that, Charlie uh, Ray. Had Fred had Fred uh, left the yeah he, yeah office. yeah Fred was Fred was in the office for a couple of years. Uh, he had been there when I came, of course, and I think Fred left about '73. And this case would have been 75, so yeah, Fred was back defending. Okay. Joe, has the, has the type of cases, uh, has that changed much in the U.S. District Attorney's Office oh, from I, the 1970s till now? Oh, I think so. Uh, when, when I started, probably a third of the docket would have been untaxed liquor or moonshine cases. I mean, ATF had an office in Columbia with 10 agents. There was an office in Cookville, I think, with another 10 agents. And I mean, they were out knocking over stills and and catching bootleggers just right and left. So we'd have a big docket of moonshine cases. Had a lot of stolen car cases, stolen property from interstate shipment, bank robberies. Those were the big majority of the cases. We had a few fraud cases. You had the stolen checks where you'd have a postal inspector show up with the uh, holding the envelope and you'd have the uh, Secret Service agent holding the check and we'd have a little three pack of uh, possession of stolen mail, stealing mail, possession of check and count and forging uh, the checks. So government checks were another good chunk. A few fraud cases. Um, I mean that LOC Industries which was that big fraud case that was kind of an exception. Um, now I don't think they've had a moonshine case probably in five or six years. Um, Dire Act cases, stolen cars rather, you never see them anymore. And theft from interstate shipment, I don't think the U.S. Attorney's Office even touches them if it's the theft's not more than 100,000 or so. So you just don't see them. You see a lot more, unfortunately, drugs, guns, um, quite a few fraud cases. Um, right. But so the, it's really shifted. And in our case, our day, the you didn't see a lot of multi-defendant cases. Now, in so many of these drug cases and other things, you're seeing just you know 20, 15, 20 defendants, and the things take just forever to get ready for trial and to get tried. Um, I mean, they many of those cases now take two, three, four years to from indictment to trial. And in our day, the, I mean, you know, we were trying cases. This was before, even before speedy trial. It, the act uh, we were trying cases. You know, most of the moonshine cases, uh, we'd try those. And Judge Gray have court down in Columbia. You'd uh, arraign them in the morning. There'd be some young, hungry attorneys down there ready for appointment. They'd be appointed, and they pled guilty and were sentenced that afternoon. So I mean, we disposed of those in a day. Uh, now, now I mean, you can't. <laughs> there's, there's no way to do that now. It just did. You know, we, my day, we'd have a deal with uh, an attorney. We had a little short, if we we're going to plead guilty, a little short plea agreement. If we had one, you know, it was a page or so. You went in, pled guilty, and that was it. Now, I think the the petition to plead guilty is like thirteen or fourteen pages long. It just, you know, they've just grossly overcomplicated the whole process. And when I was there, basically, you know, the assistant. I had the case ready, I would approve it, and that was done. I think now they've got 
four levels of uh, of approvals for an indictment. So it just the whole system just takes a lot longer, and you know it may be necessary given the size of the office. But boy, it sure seems like it. It just the just gotten more and more complex, and nothing ever gets shorter. You had the you had the interesting situation of practicing during that period before two judges that I knew and admired. I wanted to ask you about that. What was it like to appear before Frank Gray day in and day out? Judge Gray was was an interesting individual. He the IRS on his confirmations had roughed him up over some tax issues and so he really did not like IRS cases and he didn't like ATF and so those were always a bit of a struggle um, and Judge Gray was um, he had a little bit of a temper uh, one day he broke three pair of glasses he tend to throw them down on the bench and he broke his he broke his spare pair and then he borrowed his bailiff's glasses and broke them uh, and occasionally when he'd get frustrated he would uh, and he was fairly short and he was bald and once in a while he got really frustrated with somebody he would put his head down on the bench and sort of roll it and if he'd flip his robe up kind of all you'd see was a robe kind of covering a little bald spot or he'd flip around in his chair and all you'd see was the back of the chair for a while. So That's the one I remember. Yeah, yeah, he could flip around that back of the chair. And, but Judge Gray and I always got along pretty well. I mean, he, uh, I can remember early in my career, I was down, I think it was down in Columbia, and he, uh, I was making an argument to the jury and he stopped me and said that was wrong. And I had a much better memory <laughs> then than I did now and so I, challenged and asked to play the record back and thank goodness the record was my version and he harumphed and told the jury to told me to proceed and so the uh, after that uh, right. he and I got along pretty well and I, I know during that LOC industry cases uh, where they were talking about the uh, uh, they, we were talking about the fraud they did, but one of the tricks they had in that thing was to have a cold call to set up an appointment with somebody to sell them this distributorship. And then somebody would call from the company and say that, a, in one case, they, they said a tragedy had befallen the salesman. His little daughter had been in Dallas at the company headquarters or Fort Worth at the company headquarters, and a truck had come by and a crate had uh, fallen on the child, and she'd been rushed in the company jet to some big hospital and but the national marketing director was going to come out and and do the sales call and so after this long trial I was fired up in my closing argument and I said something about a crate should fall on the defendant and there was an objection from whoever the defense attorney was I don't remember whether it was Fred or Charlie Ray or somebody, and, and Judge Gray just said, that's not an authorized punishment. Go ahead, Mr. Brown. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that one, I probably, I, I, was, I was fired up on that argument, but uh, as I said, that, the jury was back pretty quick. But uh, Tell us your observations on uh, Judge Clure Morton. I know Judge, you Judge, a lot. Yeah, I, I probably tried more cases in front of Judge Morton than anybody. Judge Morton was, I'll have to say, Present judges excluded, obviously. Uh, judge Morton was probably my favorite judge. He was decisive. He was fair. He was tough. He he did not like people messing around. But if you were prepared, your case went real well. He let you generally try your case. He did tend to sometimes ask questions. He had a little sign up on his desk was at the initials K Y D M S, which was keep your damn mouth shut. And I know one case. Uh, I'm trying to remember who the who the defense attorney was, but the defense attorney was asking some questions that were, and Judge Gray, I mean Judge Morton was asking uh, several questions, and and every now and then we didn't have an appeal where they thought he was a little too active in the case, and so I asked for a bench conference and went up and kind of pointed at the sign and. He said, Mr. Brown, you think I'm asking too many questions? I said, well, Judge, there's a couple I'd like to ask. And he just laughed and sent me off. <laughs> but uh, he, he was just a, a fine judge. Unfortunately, he came here 
right at the height of the school desegregation problems with Nashville. The case, the school desegregation case was assigned to Judge Gray and as what happens when you get a new judge in, because uh, he had replaced Judge Miller. And so he got that case and decided it is as only the law, law was clear. I mean, there wasn't any doubt how the case had to be decided, but he decided it. But because of that, uh, the upper echelon of Nashville society treated him very, very badly. They, they you know, he was not admitted to Bill Mead Country Club back in the days when a judge could be a member. And his wife was, he said his wife was just, you know, he'd go to a cocktail party and people would just chew on her and um, he said that, you know, her flower bed just got picked up. And so he was really treated badly by, by the establishment in Nashville back in those early 70s. And he stayed, he moved up to Wessex Tower there and had a condo up there. And then as he got close to being, taking senior status, he had a chance to uh, fix up the courtroom up in Cookville. And so when he took senior status, he moved up to Cookville and did very, very well there. And uh, of course, unfortunately, his wife did, uh, died while he was there, and he, he stayed several years there and stayed right up until just a year or so before he died. But uh, he was treated much better up there. And when you went up there, uh, once court was over, if you ever went back to the chambers, he, you were gonna be there for a little conversation. And generally speaking, uh, the defense counsel and I, or I was, we'd all go back, Webby or somebody, and he was very strict about not letting anybody uh, have uh, sort of buy him lunch or anything, but I think one time Vince and I took him to lunch, and he said that's the first time he'd ever let lawyers ever let lawyers buy him lunch. But we, Vince and I took him to to lunch, and you'd go back there after trial and chat with him or such. In fact, uh, I go up there to court once in a while and hold court now in Cookville, and I, I still, if I sit behind, sit there at his desk, I still kind of shudder to think he's going to come in and say, "What are you doing behind my desk?" So, but he was he was really one of our best jurist. He was moved cases along, tried them, and um, I thought it was pretty fair. But if you weren't prepared, uh, he could take your hide off. Let's go to 1981. <laughs> you had been in the um, uh, district attorney's, U.S. District Attorney's Office for 10 years now, mm -hmm. and uh, I believe you got an appointment to be the U.S. District Attorney. Yeah, uh, that was somewhat fortunate. Uh, I was very happy being first assistant, um, and they essentially, Hal Harden uh, resigned, as, of course he'd been appointed by Carter, and they were looking around for a replacement. I really didn't have much in indication or in inclination to apply for it, and then the sort of name came up that it was going to be a, a, a young attorney who was two, three or four years out of law school and had never had any criminal work, and so I thought, well. And the President Reagan had said that he wanted the uh, Justice Department to consider uh, attorneys that had some experience, uh, particularly as an assistant U.S. attorney. So I said, well, what the heck, I'll just put my name in the pot. And next thing I know, I got called up to Washington for an interview with the Associate Attorney General, who then was Rudy Giuliani. Is that right? Yeah, it was, it was, it was Rudy himself. And... Uh, he subsequently then uh, gave up that lesser position to go down to be U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. And Southern District's always considered itself to be uh, really main justice. Uh, right. And but uh, Rudy, you now interviewed me and asked why I wanted the job, and and they decided uh, at that point uh, the senators were asked to send up three names. So uh, Senator Baker was kind enough to send up my name with the. Uh, with the with the younger fellow who was actually the first choice from a political standpoint, right. and one other name uh, was a someone from as I recall from Columbia, and the department decided well with the experience they they appointed me, so that that's how I got it. I, I didn't have any real political I didn't have any real political connections, one way or the other. You know I came out of the army, was non political when I was in the office. Uh, so I, I stayed pretty much non-political the, the whole time. Uh, I hired assistants um, when I was U.S. attorney based on their qualifications and, you know, political consideration was was way down the line. I, you know, 
whether I would have taken a you know an absolutely rabid, unreconstructed liberal. I, I really didn't have that uh, that problem. But uh, I suspect of the people I hired. Uh, I don't know that a majority of them were Democrats, but probably close to it. Uh, but really ended up hiring some really good people, and, and a lot of them are still there. A lot of them, you, lot, um, yeah, a you, lot of them are still there. When you when you came in as the U.S. District mm -hmm. Attorney, did you institute any major changes in your office? No, Hal Harden uh, had run an excellent office. There were good assistants there. There were some that. You know, as any time, we'll go ahead and change. But I didn't ask anyone to leave. Um, I kept the the same uh, same staff. Uh, was able to hire some additional people, and um, I tried to run the office as non political as, as I could. I mean, any time you go after someone that's a politician charging with corruption or something else, you know, the first defense is it's all politics. I'm not guilty. It's all politics, and. You know, I still got those defenses. Of course, right as I was, Hal was finishing up, and I was getting ready to, to start. We had the Blanton years, which was the prosecution of, of Governor Blanton and his legal counsel Eddie Sisk and others on selling pardons and paroles, and then uh, Blanton for selling liquor licenses. Tell us a little bit about that first big case that um, you had to handle because it's one every Tennessean remembers, and that was uh, when Governor Blanton got into trouble. Yeah, we that was when Hal Harden was still U.S. Attorney, but because uh, Governor Blanton had appointed Hal to a circuit judgeship here in Davidson County, Hal had recused himself from most of that case, and so it was actually a joint work with um, Western District of Tennessee, uh, where Hick Ewing was the prime uh, actor down there, and and then I had the case here, and we began to get you know the rumors that pardons and paroles were being sold, that you could get a, either a pardon or a parole uh, by paying a certain amount of cash, uh, and it was going through the uh, through the governor's office, uh, through the legal counsel office, and began an, the FBI began an investigation. They called it Tempar uh, for Tennessee pardons, I guess. And we, the FBI developed some sources, and a guy named Art Baldwin, who was a, ran strip joints with uh, his, with his ex-wife or wife, ex-wife had switched around, who had stores here and uh, places here in Nashville, like the Classic Cat and some others, and he had uh, stores in Memphis, and so he, for one reason or other, started cooperating and made contact through a highway patrolman who was on the governor's security detail named Taylor. And we would negotiate and talk with him and we ended up giving a list of people that we were willing to pay some money to see if uh, we'd run a pardon and conducted other investigations trying to find out where people were, where there were paroles that looked odd that just were different. Uh, the governor, of course, had, had had an individual, I think his name was Rusty Denton, that uh, was probably not paid for, but uh, as a matter of just of politics, uh, his father, as I recall, was political power up in, up in I want to say Cock County, but I'm not sure. But anyway, the, there was speculation about him being pardoned, and that. the governor came off apparently the airplane and Channel 4 popped a question to him, and I suspect he'd had a few drinks on the airplane, but he announced he was going to pardon this individual who, if it's, if it's the case I'm thinking about, I think he'd pled self-defense in shooting his wife and her lover 18 times with a two-shot Derringer. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, he, he ended up, and that, but that got a lot of people talking, and it got complaints coming in, and people saying, well, so-and-so may have done this, and then people came in and said, well, we paid money and we hadn't heard anything. So we began to get a lot of information. So we ran an undercover investigation, paid uh, Taylor some money on a number of cases, and had a takedown day when we took down uh, Taylor and uh, uh, Eddie Sis, the legal counsel. Uh, never directly tied the pardons and parole for money to the governor. 
uh, other parts of the investigation tied him into and what he was actually convicted for uh, was selling uh, liquor licenses. Um, he had to approve them and could only have a certain number, and so uh, he was taken and was convicted of taking money for that. But the pardon parole pretty much ended uh, with Sisk. But we ended up trying that. And of course, it got a tremendous amount of publicity. We got a search warrant for the Capitol, which is the first time, as far as I know, we've ever had a search warrant of the state Capitol. And found the list uh, that we had paid money for. We found the list there in the legal counsel's office ready to be processed. <clears throat> and then the governor had already signed a number of, of uh, paroles, which we had some suspect about suspicions about him, and after the, the raid and such, uh, he was before the grand jury, and and as it was coming up, Lamar, of course, had been, um, he was a classmate of mine at Vanderbilt, undergraduate, but Lamar came up for, to be sworn in, and the this word, was Lamar Alexander. Alexander, right, the word got around that Blanton was going to go ahead and sign another batch of, uh, of uh, pardons. And the way the Tennessee law was set at that point, his term was technically up like on a Tuesday, but the inaugural, the formal inauguration and uh, Governor Alexander taking the oath was gonna be on a Saturday. And this, but he was preparing to, to do these uh, pardons in that time where Lamar could take the um, oath of office early and become governor. And so Hal Harden, at that point, I talked to Hal about it and told him what looked like was going on. We had someone in the in the legal counsel's office that told us, you know, they, they've got a whole stack of them ready to go. And we thought some of them were highly suspicious. And so Hal went over and talked to, uh, to Lamar, talked to uh, uh, Governor, uh, Senate Governor McWhorter and uh, Speaker of the House, and uh, and they essentially agreed that in order to prevent what looked like uh, some real problems uh, with pardons that should not be granted, Lamar would go ahead and take the oath of office early. And so he took the office early, and uh, his appointed uh, legal counsel who then was uh, Bob Lillard well, had a stack of them ready to go over, and he was it was headed out the door, as a matter of fact, and they told him, no, uh, you know, Blanton's not the governor anymore, and uh, those are not going to be signed. And so they were, none of them were, were done, and that's uh, what happened. It was a great, you know, combination between, of course, Lamar was a Republican and the Democratic uh, uh, House and uh, Speaker and such, and that this was something that needed to be done, and it, it was done done very well. And Hal Harden was, was the prime instigator of it. I, I stayed out of that, and I was handling the, the legal part of it, but that was a political part of it. Now, that was a fascinating period, and one thing I think we, we tend to forget that I want to ask you to just mm. finish up on is what finally happened by way of prosecution of Governor Blanton. Mm. Um, we had several that pled guilty. Well, we had a trial that went six weeks, and Judge Neese was the presiding, and Neese had a heart attack, and so the case uh, delayed a while. Uh, Judge Merritt from the Court of Appeals came down to, to take it over and he ended up declaring a mistrial and so we had to go back later after we went through some double jeopardy issues. Went back and uh, and finished up the trial but uh, Sisk pled guilty, um, Taylor pled guilty, a couple of other people in it pled guilty. Charlie Benson who was in the legal counsel's office went to went to trial and was actually acquitted. Um, uh, so he was the only one out of the group that was acquitted and had some problems with that case. Some of our, two of our best witnesses that would have been against, uh, involved in Benson were, were killed uh, and probably one of them was a drug dealer in Chattanooga and the other was a gambler down in Columbia, but two of our best witnesses were killed so that testimony was unavailable to us. So the uh, jury acquitted him. Uh, and uh, but he never he never practiced he never practiced law he never he'd graduated from law school but never took the bar and never never practiced so uh, and of course a lot of the none of the other pardons went through and 
those that were granted were granted. But And the charges that were finally tried against Governor Blanton were not charges. No, they were crimes. they were they were charges growing out of the sale of liquor licenses. And how did that trial come out? Uh, he was convicted along with um, two other individuals that assisted him in the case. So there were three of them tried. Uh, Bob Lynch and uh, Leda Trogger, now Judge Trogger, were the two assistant prosecutors because we were doing the pardons and parole at about the same time, and so uh, I had the the pardon and parole part of it, and uh, Leda and Bob had the uh, had the uh, liquor license part of it, and they they got convictions. Um, uh, and, and man, he had some he had some good attorneys, uh, but. Uh, um, and Bill started. Willis. Bill Willis was was one of his right. one of his attorneys, and of course we lost. Of course Robert we lost Paul. Bill. Yeah, we lost Bill and three of our stalwart attorneys this year. Do I recall correctly that that Governor Blanton did serve? Oh time? yes, he served. He was he served. Um, I think he served three years. That was my recollection. What yeah. other what other cases during the roughly ten years that you were oh, United I've, States Attorney? <laughs> what else stands out in your mind? Oh, and of course, there was always there was the Fate Thomas case, uh, yeah, Sheriff 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 Fate Thomas, who was political powerhouse for years and years with his rabbit, uh, rabbit uh, sure shot rabbit dinners, and most politicians, particularly in Davidson County, if uh, you went through Thomas for a lot of other things, and he'd been investigated. We had two investigations we closed just. Never could quite get enough evidence, and finally got uh, got an informant in, and got a, enough case where we just show he was what all he was doing. I mean, there was one situation where he was uh, he was convicted of some tax evasion, some other thing, but he was he was uh, charging the the Catholic uh, men's group for breakfast to put it on. He was claiming it as a deduction, charitable deduction that he was doing it. And all the food and stuff came from the jail, so he had a three-way, a three-way fraud going on, on providing <laughs> breakfast for the Catholic men, uh, men's group. But uh, he, and that was a, a pretty long case. Uh, uh, but again, just a political case. We had a number of cases there that involved politicians. We had uh, Tommy Burnett from the legislature. We was charged uh, and convicted one of the tax counts and when he ran ran for and was reelected while serving that sentence and then came back and was later convicted um, for um, setting up phony uh, bingo uh, licenses and such Tennessee had a provision that against bingo except for certain charitable things and you had to have had your license and you could only do certain things so he set up a he helped set up a whole bunch of phony phony uh, bingo charity thing and they were pure profit they were just pure gambling thing so uh, he was he, uh, he was he was one of the more powerful members of the house at uh, at the time you mentioned um, that one of your deputies was a lady Tronger, mm -hmm. and i believe she's become a united states district judge here she is yeah well, later was uh, assistant u.s attorney and then uh, she was my first assistant for a while but uh, no she's now Always treat people that you that work for you with care. You never know when you may work for them. Any any uh, other deputies who've gone on to higher positions um, under your or following um, your district attorney? Well, I mean, you know, Nancy Jones, our disciplinary counsel, John Williams is well, just a bunch, but Bill Farmer. A bunch of them have gone on to a lot of of good things that in the over the years, um, just some some really good attorneys. I mean, the, there are a lot of assistants that stay there for a number of years that you know retire there after 20 years, and there's five or six up there now that I, that I still that I hired, and that's been 20 years. Uh, it's a great position. Assistant U.S. attorneys are a great position for for young attorneys to. To get some experience, but unfortunately, they're not hiring them right out of law school. They, you really like them with a couple of years' experience, and then you know, hopefully, they'll stay with you a few years and and move on. But they've th there's just a lot of them that have have gone on to a lot of a lot of good things. I've I've say I've been fortunate to have 
some really first-rate assistants that, that work for me. And I see a lot of them appearing in front of me now. At, uh, but, you know, again, last, uh, what, 13 years now has been as the magistrate judge, and that's uh, that's been been different. Uh, you're not the advocate anymore. And, and uh, interesting enough, of course, most of the time when I was in U.S. Attorney, and then that six years I spent over in bankruptcy as the special assistant U.S. trustee for criminal prosecutions nationwide, I, I helped write the manual for bankruptcy fraud prosecution and went around the country training bankruptcy and then I'd be appointed a special assistant U.S. attorney to help with grand jury on some investigations, and one of which involved a deputy chief of police down in uh, New Orleans that was convicted of bankruptcy fraud. So when the, when the administration changed markedly, I think in about 1990 or so, right, and it was time for a new U.S. District Attorney, you went to the trust, U.S. Trust went over to the U.S. Trustee's office, right. And, and tell us what, what type of work you did there. Basically, I reviewed all the reports of fraud from the U.S. Trustees nationwide, look at them to see which ones were the best ones, and then I would try to pride the U.S. Attorneys to, to prosecute uh, those cases and would be willing to go out and assist in, in the prosecutions of it. And as I say, that for the U.S. Trustee program, I wrote uh, the, the manual for how to, what constituted bankruptcy fraud, how to, how to prepare reports and how to, how to work on it. And then I went around and did a lot of training for the trustees and the attorneys in the practice bankruptcy. What is fraud? How do you detect it? How do you report it? What can happen? So it was an interesting six years. Yeah, well, you were actually the national coordinator yes. for fraud right? yes. for that office. Yeah, the deal was, though, I could stay in Nashville. I didn't have to go to Washington. Perfect. Well, I'm glad that you worked <laughs> out that deal. Anything, um, um, you know, other than the fact that you did a lot of traveling and worked, I guess, at all levels of the attorney general's work or, the, with, I guess, the trustee's work, anything that stands out? No, you know, overall, my, my experience with the Department of Justice over the years was great. I, I've still got the U.S. Attorney flag over there in the corner, and I got an award for, from the Attorney General for working uh, in uh, budgets. I helped write budgets for the U.S. Attorney's Office over the years, and I did a lot of work uh, with the sentencing guidelines. Uh, when that they first came in, proposed in 85 or so, and then adopted in 87, I was the the chair of the U.S. Attorney Committee that worked to get the guidelines to work. So between really 85 and 91, I did a, an awful lot of work on the guidelines. I was really, in many respects, DOJ's lead on on the guidelines. Uh, now, of course, uh, as Magistrate Judge, I, I've totally switched. Uh, I do very little criminal work and certainly no, no felony work now. Uh, and I do mostly civil, so I've, I've had to get really familiar with all this uh, Title VII and, and the various civil aspects of it, so into discovery disputes and things like that that you really didn't have to worry that much about in criminal law. The, the job of national coordinator for the trustee's mm. office lasted until when? Uh, 98, 91 to 98. And then um, at that point, did you receive an appointment as magistrate mm. judge? Right, I applied. You have to go through an application. I applied. The committee included me on five, and then out of the five, uh, the the district judges then vote voted. And I, I I won the won that election. So it's been now. I'm trying to calculate about twelve, thirteen. Thirteen years. years. Yep. I'm in my fourteenth year. What observations have you had? What have you enjoyed about the job? What haven't you enjoyed? Well, you know, I think overall I've enjoyed it immensely. It's a good time to work with attorneys. I've had some interesting cases. Um, I suppose, you know, the the downside of it is just, oh, you know, the discovery disputes um, and just the civil litigation is different from criminal. With all due respect, the criminal lawyers tended, especially before we got into the government trying to forfeit their fees, uh, were much more civilized. Criminal lawyers, it was a smaller bar, you knew each, you knew each other. A lot of things were done on handshake. And, you know, we provided them their discovery and their Brady material and had pretty, a fairly open book on it. And 
and vice versa, they they handled it pretty well. If you know, if one of the attorneys came over and said something, and Jim Neal or Vince Webby or uh, Jim Price or, or some of the first-rate criminal attorneys, you know, you could bank on it. it. There wasn't any dispute over it. And we didn't have these long documents. And as I say, it was a much more civilized thing. It's, Attorneys now, particularly on the civil side, they just don't get along nearly as well as as the criminal people did. And it, yeah. I don't know how much of it, Gareth, is is the computers. I mean, the computers are great, great things. But back in the old days, you know, you I dictated something to a secretary, and if you made copies, you either used carbon paper or you had a 714 Xerox machine that blazed out. I think seven copies a minute, or seven pages a minute, and things just weren't as voluminous. Now with word processors, you know, you hit a key and you can spit out 10 pages of definitions, 20 pages of interrogatories, and email people instead of thinking about a letter. I mean, I had a secretary that if I wrote a hot letter, she'd take her sweet time typing it and probably throw in a few errors and sometime would even ask me, did I really want to send that? Right. And, you know, you'd kind of think about it a while. Now with email, you you know, you type the thing out and you hit send and, and of course, the other side gets it and they look at it and so they fire back a hot reply. And the next thing you know, you're into, you know, this vitriolic exchanges and if people just slow down and think about it a little bit or, or actually talk to each other. And now it's, I see motions that, well, I phoned them at 5 o'clock and they didn't respond and by noon the next day and so I'm filing this motion. And they never talk to each other. And uh, I have a requirement in my orders that, that kind of irritates, probably irritates some attorneys, although they won't say that. Uh, but I require before they can file a discovery dispute, they have to have a phone call with me. Mm -hmm. And 90% of the time, uh, I resolve those without anybody ever filing a motion. They tell me what their problem is, and I tell them what, what the answer is going to be, and that's it. And a lot of times they'll set up a phone call and a day or two off, and by the time they get to it, I find they've resolved it because they finally have to talk to each other before they talk to me. And, and so a lot of it resolves, or if we do, we just resolve it on the phone. Now, there's some that obviously are more complicated, and you have to you have to have pleadings, but I, I just you know find that so much of it is is just boilerplate, and I really don't think a lot of the attorneys take the time to to craft their pleadings as much as they should. And volume is volume does not replace quality. One of the big services I gather that your job performs for the for the federal courts and the district judges is that you end up handling, at the ground level at least, most of the discovery disputes. Almost all. For, for the judges that use the magistrate, for the district judges that use the magistrate judges, yeah, we, we really handle all that underbrush. Um, our rulings on discovery issues and that are what they call non-dispositive, so there's an appeal, but the, the standard of review is clearly erroneous and contrary to law. So you don't get reversed too often. I'll admit when I get reversed, it's kind of harsh language that my, my opinion was contrary to law and clearly erroneous, but that's the standard. And, uh, you know, very, and there's, actually, there are very few appeals of, of decisions. Most of the time, the lawyers just really want a decision. I mean, sometimes the client just says, look, do I have to answer all these questions? Can we object? And, you know, the, so the lawyer really just wants a ruling that, yeah, you've got to answer those questions. Exactly. Or, you know, sometimes they are kind of silly, and so you say, you know, you don't have to answer that. So you, know, you just you cut have, it out. Um, uh, you have also a profile that uh, you're probably aware of, of, of being a very uh, acute mediator, an mm -hmm. astute mediator. Um, how, have you, how have you enjoyed that? Is that something you think is good, bad, indifferent? Uh, I think it is. I think it is good. Um, you know, I hadn't done any mediation. Well, of course, in criminal, as U.S. Attorney, I mean, I'm negotiating all the time with defense attorneys about the uh, sentence on guilty pleas. But there's no, there's no third party in that. That's just between the the two attorneys, which is the way, frankly, I think a lot of settlements ought to be. And the civil side, I'm sure a lot of cases settle without 
intervention of, intermedi of uh, mediators and such. But so many times now, it, it seems like the attorneys really don't want to talk to the other side and really get serious about negotiating until they come to a mediator. So I probably do, I'd say I average three or four a month of settlement conferences with attorneys. And, you know, they give me their papers. And a lot of times they just have not exchanged real, as Judge Higgins would say, they haven't really shed any blood uh, before they've come. And But, you know, I, I take what they've given me. I, I work with it. And I try to see if I can get to them sides. I ask, uh, I ask each side to give me uh, sort of their bottom line. And as a general rule of thumb, if I have the plaintiff's bottom line and I double the defendant's top dollar, and if those figures overlap, I should settle it. Um, and that's generally true, but it's a matter just simply of working with the parties. And in many cases, I'll go ahead and give them my evaluation of what I think is a reasonable range and of course, you know, there's nothing precise about it. There's no x-ray that you know what a jury would do. And the case was tried 10 times, you'd get, you know, probably five or six different results. But I'll, I'll give the parties uh, sometimes a range of figures and ask them to look at it. And I've been fairly successful in getting them to, to generalize to that range. And you keep a batting air? You know, I did. Uh, Ju Judge Griffin and Juliet got me started uh, when I was first appointed and asked me to do some and yeah, you know, I'd never had didn't had any training or anything in it and I settled the first four that I took and so I started keeping averages and then I ran into a bad streak and so I quit taking it so I quit I, I quit I, I quit I quit I quit, I quit while I was ahead I, I think I'm generally successful in somewhere probably around 70 to 75 percent just generally speaking and a lot of them you won't settle that day, but a week later they'll they will have settled it. You've 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 convinced the plaintiff it's not quite as certain as they think, and the defendant that they've got more problems. And they go home, and even though they couldn't reach a result while they were here in the office, they reach a result in the next couple of weeks. If you don't mind, I would like to uh, sort of finish up talking mm -hmm. a little bit about the work you've done in the in the community, because uh, I realize that's been a a big part of your life mm -hmm. as well as your career on the bench and before that as a prosecutor. First of all, you've already mentioned the military. Mm -hmm. When did you finally retire? I was, uh, I was retired screaming and kicking in uh, July of uh, 1991. Uh, after I left active duty, I stayed in the Army Reserves and served at uh, units in Louisville. Uh, and in Nashville, and uh, commanded a law center, uh, which was a, eight different judge advocate detachments scattered all over Kentucky and Tennessee, which interesting uh, exercise. And I was an inspector general for a training division in Louisville, and so I ended up uh, retiring as a full colonel uh, after 30 years, which is mandatory retirement, and very much enjoyed that. It was a lot of weekend weekend works. It uh, it's not just one weekend a month that uh, when you get up into the higher ranks. It, right at the end, I was we had the first Gulf War, and I actually did a 15-minute video that was explaining the rights of all the soldiers coming back from the Gulf War, what their rights to reemployment was. So it's a, it was a 15-minute tape, and it was shown to everybody that came off active duty in, back in uh, 81, 82, uh, I'm sorry, 91, 92, when the first Gulf War ended. So the military was... Uh, as I say, it was a big part. I enjoyed it. Uh, since then, I've gotten involved with the Civil Air Patrol. Uh, I, when I was in the Army, I already had a law degree, and so what was I going to do with the GI Bill? So I used it to get about all the uh, aviation ratings I could get. There's single engine, multi engine instruments, flight instructor airplanes, flight instructor instruments. So. I've kept that up over the years, and so to give some back, I've been highly been involved in the Civil Air Patrol since mid '90s uh, as a pilot, and you know, doing search and rescue, doing training, and right now I'm the uh, standard standards and evaluation officer uh, for pilots for the Southeast Region uh, Civil Air Patrol. Have you also done some? Um Volunteer work with life flights. And you know, for a long time, the Red Cross uh, had uh, we used uh, 
airplanes to transport blood because it has to be processed in the time it's drawn in the field to processed at the lab. You had a time frames there, and so we would go fly and pick up the blood, bring it into the Red Cross, and deliver it. And I did that for a number of years. They they've now uh, gotten additional time, so they they're not using aircraft anymore on that. And, and of course, I've been active with the scouts as a assistant scoutmaster. I'm still assistant scoutmaster with with you in Troop. Uh, 42, although I'm not making quite as many hiking and camping trips as I used to. And a bit active with the church, uh, been junior warden and senior warden. And I've You've been senior warden twice. twice. Now, junior warden four times, which I think is a record. And this is at St. David's Episcopal, Episcopal Church right. in West and, Nashville. Yeah, I've always had a mechanical aptitude, so I've, I've always enjoyed actually working with my hands. So I, I enjoy getting down and getting down and dirty and you know and I still do my own uh, own yard work and my own mechanical work for the most part although all these cars now with all the computers I can't I can't go out and change the the, the timing uh, the points and stuff like I used to I have to use a mechanic for a lot of it but I can still change my own oil most of the time well there's there are very few lawyers in Nashville who don't know the light blue pin touch. Yeah, I kept that thing from uh, 70, <laughs> 73. I finally, it finally gave up the ghost in uh, two, about two years ago. But I, yeah, I ran that thing for a, for a long time. Of course, the one I'm driving now is an '84 Toyota, so it, it's it, it's good. I'm working, I'm working on another one. Yeah. How I'm working about on teaching, another. Joe? Have you, uh, have you talked? Uh, I think you have. Yeah, I started about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I started teaching a criminal law course out at Nashville School of Law. It's, so about every other year I teach a, a course on federal criminal law at Nashville School of Law. And then I guess five years ago I started at Vanderbilt, and so I teach a, a small seminar on um, pretrial litigation, uh, which is basically the nuts and bolts of what you do in a case up to the up through summary judgment, it's uh, it's, it's an interesting course. I've uh, I've you know a lot of the young lawyers now, they, these are all second third year students, and it's amazing. You know, you you'll ask them a question about civil procedure, and and they kind of know the civil procedure rules from their civil procedure course, but as far as sort of the practical application, and you know, how do you serve a deposition? How do depositions run? How do you videotape them? All of that stuff. Uh, they're, uh, they are they 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 need to work on it. Because when I went to Vanderbilt, there were no, and I think most other law schools, there were no practical courses. It was all theoretical. And, and all the law schools now, I think, are really trying to stress some more of the practical aspects of, of the case. I mean, what does a complaint look like? It's not you know, is it a contract? It, how do you how do you sue on a contract? How do you defend on a contract? What discovery do you take? How, what's in a summary judgment motion? Uh, uh, all of those things really do need a practical aspect of it. And you know, I'm a, I've got a lot of cases, and I've got a lot of good examples, and I've got a lot of bad examples uh, that I can use with for my students. You know, you mentioned um, some of your interests, but I I, I believe that you have done a lot of work for the Nashville Bar. Tell us a little bit about what you've done. Yeah, well, I've had, I've served on the bar board uh, twice. Uh, once as I finished up as second vice president and another time as first vice president. And I've been on the ethics committee for a number of years and been on the finance committee five or six years, I guess, altogether. I've always had a little bit of a of an interest in the in finance, same thing at church. I've been on the finance, and of course, John Kitch. I think when I was being uh, background, they were doing the background for my uh, appointment as magistrate judge. Uh, the FBI or re retired agents, I think, went out to do the background, and they asked Kitch, "Was I, you know, was I, how did I handle my money?" And I, Kitch told me with some glee that he said, "If I stepped on a dime, I could tell you the date." Uh, and he said the agent almost fell out of his chair laughing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I, I've never been accused of not being a fiscal conservative, and uh, so I've I've always had that that interest in in in, in charitable organization, church and, and bar and such. And 
you know, that you keep the finances right. It makes so much every, makes everything else go easier if you've got your finances right. And so I've done a lot of work with that and tried to serve, you know, as needed uh, when asked by the bar president or the bar board to, to work with it. And um, it's, it's, you know, the Nashville Bar has been one of the, I think one of the, I think it is the best bar association in, in Tennessee. And great people and uh, really has done a lot of work uh, for the good of for the good of the community. I've you been very you. pleased to very pleased to serve with them. I know you and Marilyn are traveling uh, mm -hmm. a good deal more now. You I think you're on senior are you on senior status? Right. I I'm on senior status so I take Fridays off and uh, and yeah we've been traveling. We've we both dive and so we've had some interesting trips to Egypt and um, and we've traveled. I finally went uh, to Vietnam last year. I avoided the all-expense-paid trip by the Army back in the 60s. So we went to Vietnam uh, back in November, and we're going this uh, uh, January to uh, Petra and uh, Jerusalem, uh, you know, assuming that things don't get too rough over there. But if you don't plan trips like that, you never get them done, and you never know what will happen next. But, no, we've, we've taken... A number of trips. I've uh, been on the bar exchange program to Cannes, uh, France. Uh, in fact, we were there. We went over. We left out of Boston the night before 9/11. Uh, bomb uh, airplane uh, in New York, and uh, we were there in Paris when we learned of the of the bombing. And uh, people in Cannes were just absolutely superb to those of us that were there. They, you know, they said we're all Americans at this point. So. And you know when you go to the the, the fields there in uh, in Normandy uh, and see all those graves, it's uh, it's moving. You've had a, a a fascinating career at practice, and if you were you know sitting talking to your grandson or granddaughter about law practices, what the challenges would be for the future. And, for the profession, what would you hmm. say? What's what would be on your mind? Hmm. Well, so far, my, my oldest grandson has gone into accounting, uh, which apparently is a hot field these days. Um, you know, I think overall the the law is is something that if you have a calling for it, you should pursue it. it it's there are some incredibly fine people in it. It's a great opportunity. I think, unfortunately, the you know law students coming out of law school now are coming out with hundred thousand plus debt. When my group graduated, I mean, I don't think many of us had had any debt at all, or if it, it was minimal. But now they're coming out with it, and the law is just it, it's much more complicated than it was before. It, it certainly has not gotten simpler over the years. So. You've really got to find something that you think you'll like, but if you if you have something you like, overall it's a very rewarding career. I think you meet a lot of fine people, and and frankly, you have an opportunity to to help people, uh, either uh, helping them with the cases or defending their cases. I I think overall, it's a worthy call, calling. Calling, uh, it's got its frustrations like anything else, but overall, I'm. I wouldn't change anything, and I would certainly encourage anybody that has an interest in it to pursue it. Uh, and but don't you know? Try not to get somewhere where you're into those, you know, 2,400-hour billing hours. You got to have a life apart from the from the law. And I I see these I see people that that get into these. You know, they make tremendous salaries. I mean, somebody in New York, beginning out, starting out making. Uh, more than I'm making as a magistrate judge after what 46 years now, but um, boy, that's a sacrifice early in your life. I, I I think better off to start somewhere where you've got a got a life because that's when you're going to be starting families, and you don't want to be spending the whole time in the in the office. But finally, again, smaller. I think smaller firms are. I like smaller firms, although. Used to be a small firm was three people. Now a small firm is probably exactly. twenty. Probably twenty. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think a small firm uh, and or public service, if you if you can, it doesn't pay as well 
and that's again a problem with the with the debt their students are coming out of. But you know, it's a chance to it's a chance to to really I think help help everyone. Well, Judge, uh, thank you not only for your service uh, to the profession and the bar, but thank you for your time. Well, Gareth, I appreciate it. I hope I haven't rambled too much. I mean, it's been a bad year that, you know, we've lost three of our stalwarts of Neil and Al, not just now Al Knight and Bill Willis. And I, I still look around and say, why am I being interviewed? I'm not that damn old. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess I am in some respects. So it, uh, it, you know, it's, uh, it's, things are changing, but it's, uh, it's still a great, great place to be. Thank you. Thank you.